Welcome to RGK Wheel Talk. Uh, I love it, Wheel Talk. But yes, this is our podcast where we celebrate the great and the good of Paralympic sport. Um, we celebrate Paralympic sport because we haven't seen it for so long. And it's a, a chance to, to get an in-depth chat and chin wag uh, with someone who's achieved amazing things in the sport. And today I've got my old mate, my old mucker, Mr. Terry Bible, a six-time Paralympian. Wow, Terry, how you doing, mate? Yeah, good, mate. My old mucker, eh? My old roommate. Yes, <laughs> yes. So good to see you, dude. So good to yeah, see you. Yeah, you too. Yeah, listen, before we start, I am going to say, say something, and you have to respond, Terry. You have to respond. This is a test to see if, if you still got it, Terry. All right, you ready? Are you ready? I'm not sure I am ready. Come on, Terry, you ready? What's that me? What's that me? People at home will probably be thinking, what on earth are those guys <laughs> doing? It's just some madness that we used to do when we played in the GPT. Some crazy uh, noises that we used to make. We did all sorts of crazy stuff, didn't we, Terry? The good old days, mate. The good old days. Hey, hey, listen, you're having some amazing days at the moment. First of all, congratulations to you on your career. I, I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I remember you as this uh, scrawny little kid at the um, at Stoke Mandeville Junior Championships. Yeah, and I was watching from the sideline. I was um, junior president at the time. I was watching from the sideline. And I see you come down the court, like really skinny, like that. And like, you, like <laughs> that was like, you know what I mean? As you came down the court, I was like, who is this kid, skin and bones? And then next thing you shot two threes. It's like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> back. I was like, and he's like, cool as you like. I was like, eh. and, and you were like about 13 or 14 back then. What do you remember those junior days, Terry? What, what, what memories have you got of them? Yeah, obviously the best time of lives, man. Like it was just fantastic. Obviously getting involved in wheelchair basketball to start off with, and then it all happened very quick for me. So I found myself at like junior tournaments. I was obviously at Stoke Mandeville. I was playing a lot of basketball there with a the junior team, and then obviously with the team that I was playing for. I've just got just fantastic memories. Like you know, back in the day with some of the players that are still around now, um, including yourself. I remember going there and watching you. You know, when you started playing, and yeah, man, it was just it's just that's well, that's where it all started for me. Without that, I wouldn't be where I am today. How did you get into wheelchair basketball, Terry? It was a, it was at an open day. I actually, well, I actually went to get my leg fixed when I was a, a young lad. Of, I think I'd been about 11, 12 years old. They so didn't I went do to a, a local job, Terry. They didn't do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> went to uh, like a local limb centre. Um, literally just seen a poster on the wall. And it was just an open day to come and try out. I mean, I'd never sat in a sports chair before. Um, I don't think I ever even watched wheelchair basketball. And I went along to this open day. It was just absolute madness, just watching these people whiz up and down the court faster than anything. And like you said, scoring threes, just, just having loads of fun. It was it was fantastic to watch. And obviously, the minute I just sat in a sports chair, I just fell in love with the sport, fell in love with wheelchair basketball. And yeah, I guess I guess never looked back. What was it about wheelchair basketball? What was it that got you? I think it was just the speed of the sport. And the way, like, I always remember watching people fall out the chairs for the very first time. And obviously, for me, I was shocked by, like, people falling out the chairs, but then jumping straight back up and carrying on. Like, some of these people, like, for the very first time, were taking some tumbles and, you know, some hard hits to the floor. I mean, if that was any other sport, I might have been down for a few minutes, but wheelchair basketball, just getting back up. And that was it, getting back to defence, getting back to offence. Yeah, for me, it was just, you know, it's supposed to be classed as a non-contact sport, but when you see the chairs hitting each other and stuff like that, for me, it was just phenomenal. It was, it was amazing. Do you know what was phenomenal for me, though, was like, it was literally, it felt like a couple of years after watching you at the juniors, to then be going to a, a training session at the GB, um, um, GB selection camp, you know, a year before Sydney, um, and you were there, you know, training with, training with us, it was like, let me know the, the progression, I, were you surprised at how quickly you progressed in the sport? Yeah, and I, I guess I was surprised, but I guess I was always lucky as well um, to get that invite to train with you guys for the very first time. I think I was only 15 years old. So that would be my first training sessions with a senior team. So it all came around very fast for me, but obviously I, I felt lucky as well getting that invite. 
I mean, I was I looked up to you. I looked up to Simon Munn, Dan Johnson. The next thing you know, I'm in a I'm in a, a sports venue training with you guys, and at the time you were still my heroes. It was a big shock to me, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was very welcoming. All of you helped me out and stuff like that, and yeah, we was just we look back at it now, like 15 year old, I was training with a senior men's team, you know, with a Great Britain vest on. It was like one of the proudest moments of my life. Hey, what? When, when you were training and, and you were going through the selection camps, did it cross, it, it cross your mind? Did you go there with the felt thought, I could be going to the Sydney Paralympics, I'm going to get selected? No, nah, never, no. Nah. I, went, I went there, I went along. I was helping you guys out. I was living the dream. <laughs> I was uh, telling all my mates, my family, that I was going away training with Great Britain. I, um, it, was, it was just fun for me. I was just absolutely living the dream. I just absolutely loved it. Every morning, hitting the court with you guys and, you know, next thing you know, I, I, I get down to like the last 16 players. That was a shock for me. So there's like, I automatically knew that I was going to be a reserve at least. And then I just remember getting that letter through the post. Like, it absolutely cried my eyes out. Couldn't believe it. 16 year old kid. And I was going to the Paralympic Games in Sydney 2000. Madness, can you, madness. Can, can, you still, can you still remember that feeling, you know, of getting your first letter, going to your first Paralympic Games? Yeah, because we all knew, well, you know, more than anyone, we were waiting for a letter in the post, you know, if we were selected or not. And I mean, we got down to the, like the last 16. So I was buzzing in the first place. I knew I'd be at least a reserve. Um, but in all honesty, you know, I, when the letter came through, I, I didn't have a clue that I was going to go. And um, opening up and just, just, just reading it and saying that I was going to go to my first Paralympic Games at the age of 16. It, yeah, just the tears started flowing. It was a huge shock to me. Like I was very, very lucky. I was a 16-year-old kid. I'd only been training with you guys, I think it's for like six months or something like that. So I was very, very lucky I got on that plane with you guys and, and went over to Sydney. And um, um, what do you remember of the, the, the training camps and, and the famous hill pushes and all of that stuff? Yeah, brutal. Just, just, you know, I used to come back and I used to tell my family and friends what we'd done and, and like the, because we used to go there for like a week, right? And come over for a weekend, go back for another week. And he used to tell some of the stories and the training that we did and, you know, then 5.30 in the morning push, uh, pushes up the hill. Um, if you didn't beat your time, you back down the hill. It's raining, snowing, whatever the weather was, we were down there. And, you know, we had like, sometimes we had like three sessions a day and we were training until 10, 11 o'clock at night. And like, you know, people were shocked by like how many hours we actually put on a basketball court. Do you remember um, there was one session where Dave Titmus, our coach, and, and Nige, Nige Smith, uh, God rest his soul, um, when um, they... they we used to do this thing called bricks and saves um, where in the, each session you'd, you'd be judged, they'd watch you. And if you made a bad pass or you didn't do a pick, you'd get a brick. Um, and then if you made shots, they'd give you a save. And at the end of the session, you'd have to have more saves than bricks, or you'd have to go down to the bottom of the hill and push. So you could have a day where you push, you go down to the bottom of the hill and push in the morning, which was two miles. If you didn't beat your time, you go back down and push up again. Then you do a whole day of training. And if you didn't get, and if you got more bricks than saves, then you were back down to the bottom of the hill and then you had to push. So some days you could end up doing it like four times in a day, plus all of those training sessions. It was nuts. Yeah, and if people, like, people don't know that hill. People don't know that with the speed bumps. Yeah. This hill like had speed bumps, like you had to like chip to get over. Cause that was, that was one of the roughest part was getting over speed bumps. But like I said, it was, um, you know, to go down there at 5.30 in the morning, you'd get back up the hill and some days it was raining bad and you know it was raining bad. Like we would literally get to the top of the hill, take our cushions off our chairs, empty the water off the wheelchair, jump back in and go back down before breakfast. This is all before like seven in the morning. Those it's, just, the it's just crazy. Those were yeah. the days. And then, so we go out to Sydney and I, I still think, I mean, I've, I've competed at two Paralympics as an athlete and then I've been... To, to, to six as uh, altogether working as well as, as, as a TV presenter. But I still think there was something really special about Sydney. You know, what, what was it like for you? I, it was my first Paralympics, but I mean, your first Paralympics and you were only 16. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was, it was, it was nuts. It was the first time I ever, ever played in venues like that. Like I never played in a stadium like that before. I think... Was it, was it maybe Germany, the first game? And I, I'm, yes, not, I'm not quite was. sure, was it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I remember, I think, I think I came on for like 45 seconds or something like that. Yeah. My heart was skipping a beat. I was shaking. I mean, there was a fair few thousand people in the stadium and stuff yeah. like that. I remember getting the ball and, you know, I just didn't feel right. I was shaking. Like, it was just absolute madness. But 
yeah, to just to go to that 16 and play in them stadiums. And if you remember, there was days where we used to like cross over the road to go training and like yeah. you'd get stopped for half an hour and people asking me for autographs and stuff like this. Like I was a 16 year old kid from Red Car in the middle of Sydney, Paralympic Games, getting asked for my autograph. It was like, what is this? What is going on? But yeah, it was just, I look back and it's just, you know, just an, an absolute dream come true for, for any child, I guess, for any kid. And I, I, I looked back at some of the, the pictures from that get from those games. And one of the pictures that sticks in my memory is um, seeing us, me and you both on the sideline. I, I think it was um, in that bronze medal match. Just absolutely devastated. You know, talk to talk talk to me about that that whole series. You know, we look we 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 lose to Canada in the semi-finals and then we've we've got that dreaded sent, um, bronze medal match against the USA. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I think I, I think I remember it like it was yesterday because it was my first games. So I'll never I'll never forget it, but it just absolutely heartbreaking. Like and he is a picture of me and you. I think there's Kev Hayes there as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think he's on the bench as well. And and it's ex at the exact moment the ball goes in when we lose that lose that bronze medal. I mean, for people that have not seen that, um, yeah, two seconds to go, Paul Schulte shoots from in his own half. From the halfway line. The ball's in his hat. The ball's in the air. The buzzer goes off. The game's over. But you know, the basket's the basket's good. It goes in, and I don't know. It's just um, you, you can't really explain it. You feel sick, don't you? You're like. Your stomach, you feel sick, you, the tears start coming and you, you start thinking about all that hard work that you've been through, all that months and years of training. And basically, at the end of the day, it's for nothing because you're going home, you're going home without a medal. It's it's the worst game to play in. You're playing for, you know, you play for a bronze medal. It's it's all or nothing. But yeah, I, I, I tell a lot of people about it. I remember it like it was yesterday and it was just, just a horrible, horrible feeling to finish fourth. How much did those early experiences, you know, how much you think did, did, did they set you up? for the Terry Byron water, who you are today? It just gave me a massive, massive hunger for the sport, Addy. Like, you know, to go out there as a, as a young 16-year-old boy and genuinely living the dream. I loved wheelchair basketball at the time. I fell in love with it immediately. Next thing, I've got a GB shirt on our Paralympic Games in, in, in Sydney 2000. It just made me want more. Like, I didn't want to stop playing. I wanted to get to 2004 in Athens. I wanted to, you know, make a name for myself in the sport. I was... It was quite crazy because everyone was telling me how much natural talent I had and everyone was telling me how good I could be. And obviously at the time, you don't quite believe it. You know, you're listening to people like yourself and people like Simon Munn, the absolute legend of the sport, telling you how good you could be. It just gave me a huge hunger uh, to carry on, I guess. And what, what did you do and what did you feel you had to do to get yourself to that next level? Because it's okay having the potential and having the talent but to translate it and make it into, in, in, into reality. You know, what, what was it that you had to do that other players maybe coming up could learn from you? I think, I, it, it, well, it's probably two things really. I, obviously, it's, it's dedication and time. And, you know, I went from playing wheelchair basketball once a week on a Friday evening with my team to training every single day, twice a day, uh, from travelling up and down the country, from Sheffield to Newcastle to London, you know, there's a lot, a lot of hours, a lot of traveling, a lot of hard work and dedication. You know, the younger, the younger years of my, my life were pretty crazy because I didn't really get out with friends and, and family and stuff like that. It was always basketball. They always had a, a game at a weekend. So it's, for me, it's just 100% dedication. But on the other hand, I think I was very lucky with the people I had around me. Uh, we had a fantastic setup, didn't we, back in the day with, with the GB boys and we were a great group and we had some serious legends of the sport yourself, Colin Price, Dan Johnson. And, you know, all these guys just helped me day in and day out. So, you know, it's without them, lot, again, I probably wouldn't be where I was today either. What about the, um, the, the GB world-class performance um, programme? You know, the, 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 the opportunity and the ability to be able to just train full-time. You know, how, how, how much or how important do you think that was in your progression? Yeah, massive. Um, you know, for a, for a young athlete, being able to, to train at, at, at that level, day in, day out in the best facilities, the nutritionists, S&C coaches, uh, IGK wheelchairs, the best wheelchairs, I, everything was set up for me. And um, just very, very lucky. Like, I don't think people realise how lucky the World Class Performance Programme is and, you know, the help that we get off at UK Sport and the lottery funding and stuff like that. It just sets us up to be the best team in the world. And, and right now we are one of the best teams in the world still after all them years. And um, 
you know, when, when we played, when I was, we played together, we had, we got so close so many times to get into the very top. You know, we had the world championships in 2002 in, in Japan, which we should have probably won, uh, you know, losing that 20 point lead to the USA in the final. You know, we had many European championships that we, we pretty much threw away. Um, but then you finally got to that stage. I, I'd retired long gone after that, but you finally got to that stage where you, you, you managed to get that, that, that monkey off your back and win that first Europeans and win that first world. What was that like for you, Terry? Yeah, for me, it was, it was all, again, going back to being a dream. It was a dream because I had like a number of years in the GB squad where we were just, like you said there, we were always there or thereabouts. We finished fourth a couple of times at the Euros. We got beaten semi-finals at the Euros. But if you look back, and people won't know, we only got beat by four or five points in a game. Uh, we got beaten in the semi-final by Italy that year by like five or six points it was. We were always just there, but we just never could get over the line. And I think for me, doing that so many times throughout the first six to eight years, when I finally stepped that line and we did start making finals and we won the Europeans in 2009 in Israel for the very first time, it was just such an amazing feeling that, you know, well, I went from a team that was getting beaten semi-finals, quarter-finals, not quite getting over the line to all of a sudden, you know, getting a gold medals around my neck. I was winning the European Championships, winning Paralympic medals. Obviously, um, the World Championships was kind of a, a blocking stone for us. We didn't get quite over the line. We lost in Birmingham, obviously, again, in the, semi, in the quarter-final, actually, against France. So we were always a team that other teams were scared of. Like, you know yourself, nobody wanted to play us. We were always the team that were always, always there, but just couldn't get over the line. So yeah, eventually when we did, it was uh, just, it was just amazing. The medals started flowing, didn't they, person? Yeah. And what? And out of that run of medals, which one, you know, which one do you cherish the most? Which one uh, is the, the the most special moment for you? <laughs> I've got, I've got so many. Um... You know, even, even, even going back to the, my first ever world championship medal in, in Japan, you know, when you were there in 2002, like to, to I didn't play a, play a single minute, I think, in the final, but to, to get to a world championship final and come on with a silver medal from Japan was, that was, that was just absolutely fantastic. But yeah, I think from, from Beijing onwards, there's, there's a number of games that stand out. I mean, in my personal well, there was performance. An amazing and, game, there was an amazing game in Beijing against the USA, you know, where you didn't have, didn't have the coach. Didn't have, I don't oh, think yeah, Simon yeah. was. Don't think Simon played in that yeah, one yeah. as well. And you guys just had a crazy performance. Yeah, 2008 was special because we had a lot of we had a lot of ups and downs in the background and stuff like that. We obviously we lost we lost our coach and stuff. So to come away from 2008 with a with a Paralympic medal was was absolutely insane. But yeah, personal performance. I think I went for like 30 points in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just one of them where the basket was that big and you know I couldn't miss kind of thing, but. And that was that was kind of like probably where I entered the world of wheelchair basketball in 2008. That 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 game for me really. And afterwards, after then, I had a personal performance in in 2009 at the European Championships where we won our first first gold medal in a number of years in Israel. And yeah, just there's, there's lots to stand out like personal life. Lots. Uh, I think you've forgotten one, Terry. I think you've forgotten one. Paralympic World Cup halfway line <laughs> three pointer flipping out. <laughs> Yeah, I need to find that video, man. Like, a lot of people can't find I think I've seen it once. Like, making a shot in my own half at the buzzer to take the game into overtime. Against Australia, right? Yeah, it was against yeah, Australia. Yeah. So, so we were losing against Australia um, it, it, with a few minutes to go. Um, I think I stole the ball. And I was like, I passed it to you. I, and there's only a couple of seconds to go. But I passed it to you with the intention of you passing it back to me because I thought, <laughs> I'm going to fly. And you just got to throw it over the top and I'm quick enough and I'll get the layup, right? And obviously what happened is you saw me wide open and that voice came in your head and went, Terry, don't pass that ball. <laughs> you can make this shot. And, and you hit the craziest shot. If anyone has a chance to see the 2005 um, Paralympic World Cup final GB against Australia um, and see and watch Terry Bywater's shot to put us into overtime. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I just remember the whole bench just flying on the court. Everyone was just flying on the court and they were all like grabbing me and picking me up and stuff like that. 
and yeah, I don't know. I was just, I remember just being a few seconds left and I turned and I thought I'm going to have to just throw this up somehow. And I just remember doing a hook shot. And again, as the ball's in the air, the buzzer went and yeah, it went in. We were three points down and it took us in, into overtime. Yeah. But if you remember, if you remember in overtime, you got fouled with like one second left in the game and the game's <laughs> tied and you had to knock two free throws down to win the game. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 2005, yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was a crazy game. I mean, it's a crazy sport we play and you have been in so many fantastic moments. Talk to me about your, um, your, your move to Spain, you know, and how important that has been for you and your career. Yeah, massive. And again, I was only young, I was only a young lad and, you know, I'd never, I'd never left Red Car where I'm, where I'm from. I was, uh, all my family's there, my friends there. And um, I just remember one, one season, I sat down with a coach at the time, the GB coach, David Titmus, And he was just like, he said, look, we need a serious conversation. Um, you think it's a really good idea for you to go abroad? Um, basically, turn yourself into a man, like grow up, um, improve your game and stuff like that. At the time, I didn't want to do it. Like I, did, I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave, uh, you know, my family and friends behind and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was, it was a nervous time. I remember at the airport and still getting on the flight. I was thinking, I don't want to do this. Like I do not want to do this. But I went to I went to a league where the best players in the world were. So it was only going to improve me. And I was playing against the best players week in week out. The first year or two for me was very difficult. Um, you know, I was in a, a pro team out here and I was playing against, like I said, the best team, the best players in the world. And like every single weekend, the game mattered and there was a lot of pressure on me and stuff like that. So, but yeah, probably the best thing I ever did because I think I think it did it. It made me grow up, it made me mature, it made me grow into a man and obviously it improved, it improved my game 100%. What was it about your game? What, what were the specifics you think that you learned playing in Spain that made you a better player? I think just becoming an all-round basketball player, I was, I, you know, I was always known as this kid that could shoot the ball, I could shoot the three, I could shoot wherever, a mismatch. And, um, but it was kind of like that, that was all I was known for. Like, he's a shooter. And, and I, wanted, I wanted a lot more. I wanted to be that playmaker. I wanted to be that leader of a team. And, you know, when, when you're listening to legends of the game telling you that you could be a leader, you could be a future star, you could be you know, a player that's going to play for many years for GB. And it kind of it kind of sunk in. I was like, look, I want this. Like, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. So for me to go out there and improve my game, not only shooting, but becoming that playmaker, becoming that leader of the team, and I guess becoming that player that people look up to and people want to play with. And, um, yeah, go, going out there, you then won the, um, the, the Champions Cup. Um, what was that like to, to, to win that? I think... <laughs> Were you the first British player to win the, the the Champions Cup? Yeah, I think I was the yeah, I think I was the first one, and I think. Oh, actually, no, 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 no. I, no, was I, it I, I, Phil Phil Craven? Um, ah, Phil Craven and, and, and the Sheffield Steelers way back. Ah, the, so the Colin Price is on there. Yeah, and Colin Price when the TV was black and white, they won the Champions <laughs> Cup. I remember, I remember them winning it back in um, in Milton Keynes when it was held back there. That's how, how old I am. But, um, you know, in, let, let's say in the modern era, you, you, the first British player to, to, to go out there and win the Champions Cup. What, what was that like as well? And, and, and have you won it twice? Is it? Uh, three times we won it. Yeah, I won it three times. Three times. Um, twice, which is absolutely insane. This was a tournament, like, when I was young lad, I used to, you know, dream of playing. Like, it's the biggest event in Europe for, the, for club teams. And I remember, I remember going to Sheffield and watching Sheffield, watching Oldham. At the time, playing against the Spanish and the German teams, Italian teams, I remember it was just it was madness. Because it just it came across to me that it was it was a lot more difficult than actually playing for the national team. Yeah, like you had all these players come together at certain clubs and the the level and the way the, way the teams played and stuff. It was just nuts. And I was like, when I was first watching it, I just wanted to be involved. Like I'd, I'd love to be this. Like I'd love to play in this. I'd love to play in these games. And next thing you know, yeah, I'm playing in semi-finals and finals of the tournament that I absolutely love. And, it's insane. And, and and tell me about that moment when you finally win you win the Champions League. You know what what was that like? How did that feel? Yeah, when you when you're in a in a club abroad, it's and you're in a top team. That's that's what they think about the whole season. Obviously, you want to win the league, you want to win the cup, but in the back of your mind, and all you ever hear day in day out is Champions Cup. At the time, it was Euro Cup, wasn't it? And that's all you listen throughout the whole season. And that's all you train for. Every single club just wants to win the Champions Cup. So the, in the first two years before we won it, we'd made a quarter-final and a semi-final. And we got beaten both. 
Um, you know, it was very disappointing for the club because the club put put a team together, obviously, to to win the Champions Cup. And eventually, when we did did it in in, in Germany, it was just insane. The club it was massive for the club for the players. We had a few legends in the team that were going to be there last season and stuff like that as well. So it just meant it just meant the world to me. And yeah, it's, it's just giving back to the club that have uh, put faith in you, I guess as well. And um, ¿qué tal es tu español? Hablas bien? Mejor que tú. Oh, sí, no, hombre. <laughs> Tienes que hablar mejor que yo, porque has vivido vivir allí para mucho tiempo ahora, ¿eh? You sound Spanish now. Get yourself over it. It's been, it's been 20 years since I've been out and lived over in Spain, over 20 years, so I'm forgetting it. But, yeah, what's your Spanish like? And how, I, 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 I could not imagine you when, when, when we started playing back in, like, 98, 99, yeah, you speak in Spanish, Terry Barwater. <laughs> Obviously, my northern accent doesn't go. <laughs> that must sound like the, when I talk Spanish, it must sound so northern, like, it does not go. People laugh at me sometimes. But, yeah, it's, um, you know, I never thought I'd have been out here playing anyway. You know what it's like, uh, you know, you come, to, you come to a league like this and leagues in Italy and Turkey and stuff, and, just getting on the floor week in, week out, and especially the games that weekend when you, there's a lot of fans in the crowd and stuff like that. And it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just a dream. And I'm very honoured to be able to play for a, for a club like I do, I guess. And um, who's the, who would you say is the greatest player you've ever played against? Patrick Anderson. Why? Well, I just, just, he's the, he's the Michael Jordan of wheelchair basketball, isn't he? And, you know, it's, um, you know, what's more, you know what's more crazy for me is when people talk about Patrick Anderson and talk about me at the same time. I still can't get my head around that. Because people actually do, they come up with conversations about, you know, the best players in the world, the best shooters and stuff like this. And when my name pops up and people are talking about him, you know, I've got so much respect for the guy because not only have I battled against him, I've been in big games against him. I've watched him when I, when I was young and I started growing up and, and going into the sport. You know, he was a he was a person that I looked up to, and I just thought he was absolutely fantastic. And I, and then you know, I don't believe that anyone has been anywhere near him. I just think I think he is the MJ of this sport, and I think he always will be. He's just wow. he's he's an absolute legend. He really is. I've got yeah. so much respect for the guy. The things that he does, you, um, you you played against him as well. Like he does, yeah, he does stuff in a, yeah. he does stuff in a wheelchair. That, you know, it's impossible. You sit yeah, back and you watch it. And, and he changed the game. He changed the way the game was played. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so what, what about the future? Paris, you know, what, what's your thoughts on that? Is, is Terry Bywater going to be there? I think I need to be there, Adi. I think, I think my heart's set on it now. Um, in all seriousness, if we'd, have, if, we'd have, if we'd have walked away from a gold in Tokyo, things might have been different. I'm not sure. But, you know, it's only three years away. And obviously, I've been lucky enough to go to six Paralympic games, which is absolutely crazy. I know that's nuts. But to finish on the one in Tokyo, for personal reasons and for team reasons, I mean, we didn't, we didn't get to the final. I've been at six games now and I've still not reached a, a Paralympic final. Um, it was fantastic winning the bronze. Don't get it wrong. The bronze medal feels a lot more than a bronze. Mm -hmm. It does. Like, it genuinely does. Just not having the coach there and the stuff that the group, what we did together was, was absolutely fantastic. But... You know, having them empty stadiums, you know what it's like. We've been there together in that, in you know, you're in that tunnel before you come out for a part of the big games. You can, you can hear the stadium. You can, and it gives you goosebumps. Like you can hear people waiting for you to enter the court and stuff like that. We didn't have that in Tokyo, and it was it was a very different games. Um, I want to finish on a high. Like I want to finish on the highest point possible, and I just believe that we can do it. I think we can get to the final. I really do. I think we were very unlucky this year. And I just, I want to do it in front of the crowd. I want to, I want to do it with stadiums full and, and do it the right way, I guess. Terry, amazing. Listen, it's been an honour to speak to you, my man. You know what I mean? I, I, I've missed you, Terry. We haven't spoken like this for a long, long time. And, you know, I, I, I hope you do finish on the high because you deserve it. And it'll be your seventh Paralympic Games. Would that be a record for wheelchair basketball? Yeah, I think it could be. I think it could be a record. I mean, like now, I'm... I mean, six games is crazy, isn't it? I, you look back on my first one, obviously, in Sydney with you. And, you know, to look back now, and I, I just recently played in Tokyo for my six games. Seven, I played in seven as well. I've always played in seven. Lucky GB, seven. So, you stuck yeah, on no. half of me. Yeah. That was my number. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but I mean, my, yeah, man, my, my heart's set on it. Like, I really, really do want to. I want to get there to Paris. I've got obviously got to stay injury free. Got to get selected and stuff like that. But yeah, my heart's set on set on Paris now. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, so talking about finishing on a high, Terry, we always finish uh, these podcasts with my quick fire RGK quick fire question round. Are you up for it? The RGK quick fire question round. Yeah. Yes, sir. Right, it's pretty simple. I just ask you a load of random questions. You can't think about it. I mean, you don't think about it, Terry. Just shoot it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Just shoot it. Right? And you I got that off you, eh? I got that off you. Yeah, yeah I got I that off you. That. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready, Terry? You've got a minute to answer these questions. Here we go. Paralympic gold or world championship gold? Paralympic. Speed or height? Height. LeBron, Durant, or Atatokounmpo? LeBron. Uh, hit the game-winning shot or make the game-winning block? Shot. <laughs> uh, Ravinelli or Ronaldo? Ravinelli. <laughs> Davinoy and chips or chorizo and chips? Chorizo and chips. Tickets to see the NBA finals or tickets to see Middlesbrough play in the Poundland and Egg and Spoon Cup? Middlesbrough, Poundland, Egg and Spoon Cup. <laughs> Middlesbrough win the Champions League or England win the World Cup? The England World Cup. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, that was a dodgy oh. one. Uh, um, piano or guitar? Guitar. Uh, rock star or NBA star? NBA star. Last question. Right, I've stopped, I, I, I've stopped it because I need to ask you this question. Last one. Uh, eat your own boiled underpants after a triple overtime game or lick Simon Munn's stump for two minutes? <laughs> not a single one of them. Come Absolutely on, not. answer it. Answer it. My own underpants. Terry, my man, thank you so much. Really good to speak to you, man. And Best of luck um, for this season and congratulations on everything you've achieved, man. I'm really, it's an honour to be your friend, bro. Yeah, you too, man. I really I absolutely appreciate this. Great talking to you as always. You know you're a legend of this sport as well. And big up to IGK. You know, without you guys as well, I wouldn't be here right now. So, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Well said, Terry. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, awesome. brother.